I'm continuing this Turin Turin bar material and in light of this ongoing discussion of the meaning crisis and I was going to start with a song because sometimes honestly a song kind of gets me going a little bit and uh, even my voice um, I've got allergies right now you don't need to know that but this is a song that's going to set the tone. It's um, Tomorrow Never Knows by the Beatles. And it's a kind of Taoist or Hindu. I forget what type of spirituality they were delving into. And I guess different ones of them were doing different things. But it's allowing the flow to overtake you floating downstream it's about kind of letting go not dominating or controlling the world but kind of letting the world flow and going with it so let me push this back a little bit here without break anything And grab the guitar. I didn't really tune it, but that's okay. And um, let's give this a try here. Uh, music. Uh, <clears throat> this is too big. Hold on a second. And I'll show you these lyrics here and discuss them a bit where you have um, where is it? Turn off your mind 
turn off this ad. Turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. It is not dying. So instead of having my my kind of logical, rational desire to control and know drive, turn, turn that off, relax, and float downstream. Because life is moving. Life knows something that I don't know. And it's going there. It is not dying. Lay down all thoughts. Surrender to the void. So surrender to, to the void. The void is nothing. But nothing is in Taoist thought and in other spiritualities powerful. This nothing is powerful. Um, and um, it is shining. So nothing is shining. Nothing is this source of light that you may see the meaning of within. So you're not looking for the meaning out there, but there's something within and it's just being. You're not trying to like become something, you're just, you're just being. And, and it's not like change, it's not like seeking control, it's just being. And there's love. So desire is part of this. Love is all and love is everyone. So we tend to think, oh yeah, my logical, rational, scientific approach is what's getting at truth. Desire is like this kind of fake thing, wish fulfillment thing. But desire can also be, well, especially when it's love, access to truth, deeper truths which the logical can't get at. It is knowing that ignorance and haste may mourn the dead it is believing so there's a belief thing going on here and you're listening to the color of your dream now dreams i believe uh or i think they're generally black and white so this is kind of like uh, uh oxymoron here anyway um and uh play the game of existence to the end of the beginning of the beginning so the end is the beginning so the taoist circle of continual change and, and evolution just continues flowing and and so this is a way of getting at what I want to get at which has to do in Turin's story in this Tolkien story of um, the meaning crisis and the fact that I'm searching, I'm kind of grasping for meaning. So that is kind of a logical, rational thing that I'm driving at. But the more you drive at it, sometimes the more frustrated you're going to get. And so part of my attaining meaning is letting go and letting the meaning emerge or letting the meaning kind of float me downstream. Um, and so... Um, is the world meaningful? And I guess, let's go to the screen. That is to say the little whiteboard that I draw on here. And maybe sketch this out. And think about what? Here's me. Now, this is unusual drawing. And I've got this meaning drive. I'm driving towards meaning. I want meaning. And, and so I guess I can kind of, I was thinking about this in terms of a poem by Keats, but I'm not going to go into that poem. But just to think about, like, what if I kind of get an inspiration and it's up here and I sort of kind of fly with my imagination. I'm thinking about like desire, imagination, and like a poem, a song, an inspiration. Let's call this inspiration. Beauty, something that's drawing me upwards. And then, bam, I sort of realize that was, that was kind of a, an emotional inspiration. 
that maybe isn't real. And then I'm, bam, I sort of fall to ground again. Clunk. And, and so is, is this what's real? Or was this real? Or, and then we can get, what do you mean by real? And all these things. And what this also gets at is, like, when I'm letting the stream flow, this is like that flow. And do I believe that that flow is real? Or is that a lie? I mean, that's what, you know, some critics will say is that, okay, that's a nice dream. That's a nice flow. Um emotional high that's, that's just like taking a, a freaking drug that's not real you might as well take you know cocaine but what's real is is the pain of being stuck on the ground and stuck in your life but i believe that that this is real it's not a high now there's also there's reality in both and we, we sort of is it that we I'm struggling this is it that we kind of oscillate between both I, but I think this is real like that the world that my getting into the flow the Tao the, the yin and the yang these types of things that that is real that is what is most real and like you know uh, the Beatles talk about love I mean yeah that, that's a big topic I'm not going to get too much into it but yeah let me just throw it out there love that's what's most real. It's not a fiction. It's not it's not a drug induced high. And so um, let me pause for a moment and try to improve my sound quality here. We're working on sound quality, so I'm gonna get <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> this little microphone thingy and see if this works. Testing and pardon this pause. Testing. Okay, looks like it's good. Okay. Um, so let's go through some more of Turin. And actually, this is the pre Turin story. Um, and I've got my notes here. I guess I'm just going to go back to the document camera again. That seems to be my most fruitful mode. Okay. And um, let's dive in. So here in the Children Burren, edited by Christopher Tolkien, written by J.R.R. Tolkien, not published in his lifetime. And in fact, Christopher, his son, had to really do a lot of editing to make sense of it because it was all kind of in drafts um but it's a wonderful story in some ways like the oedipus the king oedipus rex story of of a man who gets cursed and ends up with the most horrible luck in the world he accidentally well oedipus accidentally kills his father and has sex with his mother and has children with her um what we'll see with Turin who's the son of Hurin uh he gets cursed because Hurin is going to get cursed by Morgoth the the dark lord the, the sort of satanic figure in Tolkien's legendarium and um in this but we're going to get before that so here's Turin who's a young man in this scene with his friend Sador. Torin is a man, is a human being, because you have a lot of elves and you have a lot of human beings and you have also dwarves, but this is a human. And uh, as a young man, he asks, uh, what is fate after Sador tells him, uh, you know, contrasting men and elves, but the children of men grow more swiftly and their youth passes soon. Such is our fate. What is fate? As to the fate of men, said Sador, you must ask those who are 
wiser than Labadal. But as we all can see, we weary soon and die, etc. And this is also related to the fact that his sister Lalith has died. So that Lalith will not come back, said Turin. Where has she gone? She will not come back, said Sador. But where she has gone, no man knows, uh, or I do not. So he's facing these harsh realities of death. He's about to witness uh, not the death of his father, but his father's going to be kidnapped by Morgoth in this huge battle. Um, the Nirnayath Arnoidiad. And, and in this, this big battle between the... So on the one side, you have elves and humans. And on the other side, you have Morgoth and the orcs. And we see Morgoth and the orcs wanting to dominate the world. So this is kind of representing, you know, the bad desire to dominate. It's kind of a satanic type of domination that that people tend to have, and it's represented here in Morgoth and the orcs. And um, here uh, we see the kind of really harsh medieval tortures that Morgoth's people put out here. And when they uh, confront the humans and the elves, uh, with them they brought Gelmir, son of Gwilin, a lord of Nagathrond, that's an elf kingdom, whom they had captured in Bragalach and had blinded, so they took out his eyes. And their heralds showed him forth, crying, We have many more such at home, but you must make haste if you would find them, for we shall deal with them at all when we return, even so. And they hewed off Gelmir's arms and legs and left him. Wow, this is Tolkien. He's giving us some really harsh, violent images. Uh, and this is the kind of, you know, terroristic uh, approach of, of the orcs. Um, and, and, and what they're doing besides being extremely like violent and evil is that they're trying to draw the elves on and it works. So the elves, now his wrath was like a flame. Uh, this is Gwyndor. <clears throat> and he leapt forth upon horseback and many riders with him. And they pursued the heralds of Angband and slew them. And all the folk of Nargathron followed after. And they drove on deep into the ranks of Angband. So this was a way of drawing them out. And they've drawn out these elves. And now they're going to defeat them and, and defeat them utterly and kill most of them. And, um, and they get to Hurin. And Hurin... Is, is a human on this side. Uh, I think he's a son of Hador. So Hador is, is the line. Uh, and as uh, his kinsman Huor gets killed, uh, he was pierced with a venomed arrow in the eye. Um, and all the valiant men of Hador were slain about him in a heap, and the orcs hewed their heads and piled them as a mound of gold in the sunset. Last of all, Hurin stood alone. Then he cast aside his shield and seized the axe of an orc captain and wielded it two-handed. And it sung that, and it is sun that the axe smoked in the black blood of the troll guard of Gothmog until it withered. And each time that he slew Hurin, Hurin cried aloud, Aure en Tuluva. Day shall come again. Seventy times he uttered that cry, but they took him at last alive. By the command of Morgoth, who thought thus to do him more evil than by death. And then so they grab him and they bound him and took him and tortured him. Thus ended the Nirnayath Arnoidiad as the sun went down beyond the sea. Night fell in Hithlam and there came a great storm of wind out of the west. And so we have the extreme 
uh, pain and sorrow of of Horan. And, and so Horan sort of represents the good, righteous human. Here's Horan. He's the last one standing. Uh, Morgoth's men could kill him and the orcs could kill him, but Morgoth says, no, no, take him alive. We want to torture him and curse him because we want to really humiliate and, and we want to cause as much pain as possible. So better not to kill him yet. And so Hurin does not uh, bend. And so for 70 times, he says this. Day shall come again. And day is the kind of image and the symbol of, of goodness, of, of the, the truth, of, of light. And, and of course, darkness is the sign of darkness. And um, it's a statement of hope, of faith, of, 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 of acknowledging or of, of, of asserting that the world is fundamentally good, that the goodness is what is more fundamental, that it shall come again. Uh, as much as we see death and destruction and he's seen his friend's arms and legs hewed off so that and he wasn't even killed so that the guy's like writhing around in incredible pain. Uh, they took out his eyes and they did that to other people too. And like, and, and yet he still says, day shall come again, that goodness is more powerful. And that life and, and like let's put it this way the good means that there is meaning there is a meaning to this there is a purpose there is a meaning the meaning crisis has an answer is is, is what this is asserting um and and that the flow is going somewhere that nature the universe has a natural flow that has a, a direction a meaning a, a telos there's a teleology here that's the greek word for end uh end meaning like purpose or mission and it's the job of each of us to find that and, and it's not like oh it's like two plus two is four you get the answer it's not like that it's not like finding an answer like that but it's more like finding a flow you have to let go and let it happen and i believe hurin he doesn't know what's going to happen here but he trusts that day shall come again and he says this and then he faces down morgoth who morgoth who says like okay i'm torturing you uh you've lost all your people are dead uh your your, your family's back there they're going to get overrun by my my, my bad guys um and and you'd think like oh well, maybe i'll just go for like the quick fix and, and stop the torture uh if to, if i give morgoth what he wants and and what he wants is the the the, the location of of the other kingdom so that he, he can conquer them uh, in particular uh which one was the one that he wanted let's see if it says here um There, Doriath, yet remain, that's a, an elvish kingdom, and Nargathon, Nargathron, those are two elvish kingdoms, enemies of Morgoth. But Morgoth gave little heed to them, either because he knew little of them, or because their hour was not yet come in the designs of his malice. But his thought ever turned to Turgon. So Turgon is in Gondolin. So that's that's what he wants to know. He wants to, where's, where's Gondolin? So I can attack and defeat Turgon. Therefore, Hurin was brought before Morgoth. For Morgoth knew by his arts and his spies that Hurin had the friendship of the king, and he sought to daunt him with his eyes. But Hurin could not yet be daunted, and he defied Morgoth. Therefore, Morgoth had him chained and set in slow torments. So this is the torture. But after a while, he came to him and offered him his choice to go free, whether whither he would, or to receive power and rank as the greatest of Morgoth's captains, if he would but reveal where Turgon had his stronghold and all else. 
that he knew of the king's counsels. But Huron, the steadfast, mocked him, saying, Blind you are, Morgoth, Bauglir, and blind shall ever be, seeing only the dark. You know not what rules the hearts of men, and if you knew, you could not give it. But a fool is he who accepts what Morgoth offers. You will take first the price and then withhold the promise. I should get only death if I told you what you ask. Then Morgoth laughed and he said, death you may yet crave of me as a boon. And he took her unto the Houd on Narnayath and it was then new built, and the reek of death was upon it. And Morgoth set Hurin upon its top and bade him look west towards Hithlam, which is which is his home region, and think of his wife and his son and his other kin. For they dwell now in my realm, said Morgoth, and they are at my mercy. You have none, answered Hurin, but you will not come at Turgon through them, for they do not know his secrets, etc. And and then he, he gives he's going to give a curse. Uh, Morgoth does. He's, he says Morgoth stretching out his long arm towards Dor Loman, uh, cursed Hurin and Morwen, his wife, and their offspring, saying, "Behold, the shadow of my thought shall lie upon them wherever they go, and my hate shall pursue them to the ends." of the world and and so this is this curse that he puts on uh hurin here's a drawing uh I think this is christopher lee of hurin who's chained in the seat on top of the nirnaya um i forget what it's called the, the, the big hill of dead people looking out on the the lands of of his own people seeing everything that Morgoth sees, hearing everything that Morgoth So he gets all this knowledge. Um, and and, and, he, and he gets kind of unlimited knowledge, which you'd think, oh, that's good. But it's not. It's going to lead to a real darkness. Uh, I know not, said Hurin, yet so it might be if they willed, for the elder king shall not be dethroned while Arda endures. You say it, said Morgoth, for I am the elder king, Melkor, first and mightiest of the Valar. Kind of like Lucifer was the highest angel. So Morgoth or Melkor, same guy, are like the highest angel who was before the world and made it. Because the angels in the Tolkien legendarium, the Valar, uh, helps make the world. The the shadow of my purpose lies upon Arda, and all that is in it bends slowly and surely to my will. So he's like, all this stuff, the direction it's going in, the telos it's going in, it's mine. It's me, my power, my will, my will to power. But upon all whom you love, my thought shall weigh as a cloud of doom, and it shall bring them down into the darkness and despair, etc., etc. Um. And so, is Morgoth right? Is Horin right? Is, this is my really sketchy sketch, but here it is. Is the flow of the universe inherently towards fullness, harmony, beauty, love? Or is it not? Is it just kind of meaningless or is the meaning kind of like Morgoth it's kind of a Nietzschean figure some like since since the world is meaningless that one who has the most power will shape it to what their will wants their will to power and that's one way that a lot of people think the world works that ultimately it's meaningless. So grab as much power of it with you can as you can. And, and many, many modern theorists, serious thinkers, kind of view the world the same way. A lot of Marxist ideas kind of go in that direction. A lot of uh, extreme uh, 
capitalist ideas go in that direction, whether like kind of the Ayn Rand view viewpoint, um, that that the flow of the world isn't towards something good. That that's like wishful thinking. That's a lie. That's like a lot of hooey that that the rich people want to sell you, so that you'll play with their their games and keep them rich. Or or it's not. Or it's really real. And the world is not meaningless. I, I guess I'm arguing with that, that Huron is on the right side and that Turin is going to be on the right side. Um, and so um, let me pull up my notes here. I'll say a few more things about Turin before I finish up. Oh, gosh. Um, and I guess I'll just finish up and say this. that So now Turin has seen his dad well he doesn't know where his dad is he, he thinks his dad might be dead he might be alive but now we know that he's been cursed the curse is going to fall on turin to some extent and so all these bad things are going to happen to him he's going to accidentally kill a couple of people this is this sounds really edible accidental deaths uh, he accidentally kills one guy. He accidentally kills his best friend, Beleg. Uh, he leads to the downfall of one of these elvish kingdoms by accident. Again, like, it's just, this guy's got the worst luck. It's, like, totally Oedipal. And then he's going to, like, find this beautiful woman that he loves and get her pregnant. And then he, it turns out he was tricked into this by an evil dragon. And he commits incest, at which point his sister kills herself with the baby in her womb. And then he kills himself with this amazing speaking sword. And you're like, what the hell? This is the Tolkien story? This is like darker than Oedipus. And yet this is a positive story. And what we're going to see is that Turin, you could sort of think like, oh, this is just like a negative story. Let, let, let's just stay as far as way, away as we can from this, this guy. But what is Turin? Turin is a hero in the in the Tolkien legendarium, so much so that at the end times in this in a, in a manuscript of the end of the world, Turin is the one who does drives the death blow against Morgoth, against the evil uh angel the, the vala and so what so this is what we're going to move towards we're going to sort of see how does Tolkien get us there um that is it it's kind of like i mean to me i i kind of bring this up dangerously it's kind of like holocaust um accounts or like the darkest possible stories and because it's sort of like this limit case that push, pushes us to the limit. Like, like, okay, darkness is regnant. Dark darkness is what's taken over here. And yet at that moment, like that's when transcendence breaks forth or it can. Uh, Tolkien does that. Uh, I kind of go with Tolkien. I think he's on the right track here. Um, cause you can obviously look at the other way and say like, no, it's, it's just pure darkness and just give up or just, uh, or just say that the world is just darkness or the world is just meaningless and then deal with it from there. But that's, I think wrong. I think that's a wrong reading and that's certainly not the reading that Tolkien is giving. So, um, I think we're going to stop right there. <laughs>